Today, our Bible study is on Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have chosen us to be your people, that before we were born or created, you already had seen that we would be uh, the people of your pastor and that you would create heaven for us. We look forward to the time when we'll be with you face to face. But we pray, Lord, that in the meantime, that you would strengthen our faith in our walk with Christ and that through the power of your Holy Spirit, we may truly learn the lessons uh, that your people have been given through Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so here in Romans chapter 9, uh, Paul is uh, moving into a section where he is um, kind of explaining from the history of Israel what his explanations have been, like talking about what it means to be chosen by God, predestined, you know, and he talked about that, and then the glorified, which are different stages of our life with, with the Lord. <clears throat> okay, let me read starting in verse 1. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption as sons. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. So, you know, here he is uh, talking about his um, desire for the, the people of God, the people of Israel, to, um, to be saved. And, you know, he recognizes that, you know, he used to be one of those people who was going down the road to destruction. I mean, he was Jewish. He was a Pharisee. And yet, here he was actively pro persecuting anybody who believed in Jesus. And so he realizes, you know, that, that he had been lost. And now he knows that any of these other Jewish people that he counts as his brothers in his own race, that they would be lost as well. And it shouldn't be that way. I mean, and he goes through the list. They had the... Um, they had the adoption as, as sons of God. They belonged to the Lord. They were given the inheritance of heaven. He talks about theirs was the divine glory. They witnessed the cloud of God's glory. God confirmed his presence among them in lots of different ways. The pillar of cloud by night, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. The glory of God descended in a cloud over the temple or the tabernacle back in Exodus 34. And then uh, 1 Kings, I think it might be 19, were Solomon dedicates the temple and it says, and then the glory of God descended upon the temple and filled the, the whole temple area. So we know that, you know, there, that, that glory, they, they had witnessed it. They were involved with God's presence. It was a very powerful thing. No other people in the world had that. And so, you know, who else but the Jewish people should have realized that, that everything was pointing to the Messiah Jesus and that they had this. It was in their own hands. And yet... You know, they, they also have the promises, and these are the promises of God's plan of salvation, right? The promise to Abraham, all people will be blessed through you, which doesn't mean that only the Jewish people will be saved, but through the Jewish people, through Christ, who is the Jewish person, they would be saved. Uh, all people will be saved if they turn to him. And then he goes on, there's the patriarchs. So you have, you know, the examples from, from the scripture, the patriarchs in the book of Genesis. And... We know that, the, as it says here, the human ancestry of Christ is traced through the Jewish people. So if anyone should have been saved, it should have been all the Jewish people. That's what he's saying. And yet, he knows that that's not true. He himself was one that was fighting against this idea that Jesus is the Messiah. And so, in the beginning, he tells us about his great sorrow, his anguish in his heart. I mean, it's like, just imagine, as a parent, if your son or daughter rejected Jesus Christ. You love him. You want to be in heaven. You, you know that without Jesus you're lost. And your own children don't want it. That would just break your heart, wouldn't it? I mean, I can just that would be the, like, the worst thing I can imagine. One of the worst things in life. And so Paul, that's what his, his, um, his attitude is. He has this great sorrow and unceasing anguish in his heart because the people that he loves 
don't believe in Jesus. And, and obviously it's not true, all of them. I mean, he's trying to reach out to as many of them as possible. Back in the book of Acts, we say that he always went to the Jewish people first whenever he went to a new town. And then if they rejected him, kicked him out of the synagogue, then he went to talk to the Gentiles. And eventually he became the, you know, the main apostle to the, to the Gentiles. But before that, he did go to the Jewish people, trying to convert them, trying to show them that Jesus was the fulfillment. And so here he says, you know, notice in verse 3, I mean, it, who else had this attitude? I, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off. Cursed and cut off. Who was cursed and cut off so that we might be belong to, to, to God. Wasn't that what Jesus did? I mean, it tells us that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree in the Old Testament, and then Jesus is the fulfillment of that because he went to the tree. He was cursed by God. He, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. So here he has the same sacrificial attitude as, as the Son of God, that Jesus desired to become the curse so that the people uh, who turned to him would be saved. And Paul wishes the same thing that, you know, if only I could be cursed that everybody else, you know, I'd be willing to throw my life away if everybody in Israel could be saved. And that's a, a wonderful thing. But of course, we, we all know that nobody can believe for another person, right? Parents can't believe for their children. Grandparents can't believe for their grandchildren. You can't, that's why in the Apostles' Creed we don't say, you know, um, you know, we believe, we actually say, I believe, because only you can believe for yourself, right? So I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, my only Son, our Lord. So, so Paul recognizes, you know, this is wishful thinking, but, you know, it could still be a prayer. And isn't that the type of prayer, as we read back in Romans chapter 8, that, that you know, we don't always know what to pray for. This anguish in our hearts is something that the Holy Spirit he hears and he takes those concerns of our heart and lays them before the throne of the Lord, of our God, with groans that words cannot, um, cannot comprehend. So the Holy Spirit knows what his heart is, and he has the same heart as Jesus Christ, and he wants you know, his, his people to be saved. But he's, you know, he's, he's going to do what he can. So he's, he's not going to stop preaching to them, but he's also going to preach to others. And he's, in his letter, perhaps he's writing this to let them know you know, maybe there's some Jewish people in Rome that don't know Jesus yet. And that's why I'm writing this letter. You will learn as much as I can tell you about how Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing in him, you'll have life in his name. So that you can take this to, to the Jewish people who you meet and convert them. <clears throat> so notice that last little verse there where he says, uh, forever be praised, you know, um, there's different ways of translating this last sentence because it, look, it talks about uh, from theirs, from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ who is God over all. You, you could also translate this um, that uh, Christ who is over all, God forever be praised. Or Christ, comma, or I'm sorry, or Christ, period, God who is over all forever be praised. So, it, you know, the, the punctuation in the Greek is implied. We don't have, they don't actually have Greek punctuation. So, um, however, you know, whether or not they're saying that Christ who is God over all or Christ, period, then it says God over all be praised. You know, it doesn't really make any difference necessarily because we do know that the Bible com, um, proclaims Jesus Christ to be God. So that's not really an issue. Some people, <clears throat> you know, use this verse to, tr to show, you know, look, the Bible says that Christ is called God over all, uh, and then some other people who reject the idea that Jesus is the same as God, like we say, you know, in the Nicene Creed, that Jesus is very God of very God, begotten, not made, you know, of, a, of the same substance as the Father. People would say, well, this verse doesn't necessarily prove that because it, it could be taken by putting a period after the word Christ and then changing that next sentence to just say that God is over all. So, so because there's some ambiguity, um, you know, uh, other cults and stuff like that have used passages like this as kind of a proof text to try to prove their point. 
well, see, look, the Bible doesn't say Christ is God. And then they, they try to, to change this. Uh, and, and, you know, I guess it would be nicer if, you know, the Bible was absolutely more clear. But the problem is, like, as it says in Isaiah 55, 11, God's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. So no matter how much we try to understand who God is, human words are always limited, right? They're never going to be enough. God is so much greater than our words can comprehend or describe. So um, that's why you, could, you can't just take one verse out of the Bible and say, well, look, this proves that Jesus isn't God. Or this proves that Jesus is God. You look at the whole totality and see, well, it, has it been giving us a theme all along? And the answer is absolutely yes. The theme is that Jesus is God. <clears throat> okay, let's look at verse 6. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. That's a quote there from uh, Genesis 21, 12, God talking to Abraham. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. And that's Genesis 25, 23, God speaking to Abraham when he went to visit him with the other two angels before the year before his child was born. So what's going on here? You know, it, we know that... Uh, that the people of Israel, it says those who are descended from Israel, notice in verse 6 it says, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, but then it goes on um, talking about that the true children of Israel are not the natural descendants, but what? Okay, well how do we become children of Israel? That's right, through faith and the promise to Messiah. All right, so because that's what he's saying. It is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise. That's what it says in verse 8. So here he's reminding us what the Bible says. Because notice what is notice he doesn't talk about... Well he, does, well, he does talk about children of Abraham, right? But also he's talking about children of Israel. Because what is Israel? Where did that name come from? Do you remember? Jacob. That's right. Jacob was the deceiver. That's what the name Jacob means. Jacob, he was the heel grasper. He... He tried to get the um, birthright from his brother Esau. And it wasn't that, you know, he stole it, even though later on it makes it look like he stole it. Remember how he, you know, dresses up like his, his brother and goes to his father and, and he gets blessed by, um, uh, he gets blessed by his father, um, his, uh, Isaac. And he doesn't, uh, then the father says, well, I can't take it back once... Esau finds out the truth. But Esau, earlier on in the history, you know, had already given it to him. He says, you know, he sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. So what Jacob was actually doing was just, I mean, this is, in essence, he, had, he was just getting what was rightfully his because his brother had given it up to him. And his brother uh, probably was going to be like the type of person who said, well, I didn't really mean it or something like that. You know, I mean... How do you get the birthright if somebody doesn't want to give, it, doesn't want you to have it? So he was taking, well, and I guess in a way, Jacob wanted it far more than Esau did. Esau, it says in the book of Hebrews, he spurned his birthright, and because of that, God hates. It says God, it says Esau I hated, Jacob I loved, uh, and th those. Or that's hyperbole, you know, the language that's used in the Bible often is like trying to show the, the opposites. God doesn't hate anybody. God cannot hate because hate is, um, well, I, I well maybe put a little uh, spin on that. God doesn't hate people because he, he loves us, and yet he hates the sin, and he also hates what is evil, right? Because the, the book of Proverbs actually says that God hates evil. So, you know, that, that's okay to say that God hates evil, but people he doesn't necessarily hate. Uh, but he, he does receive uh, Jacob, who had his name changed to Israel, in, in the time when he was struggling with God. He wrestled with the angel of the Lord, who was God in the flesh. So as he wrestled with this angel, back in the book of Genesis, you know, when, he, when 
Jacob says to the angel of the Lord, he says, um, he touched his hip and it says, and, he, and then all of a sudden his hip was dislocated. Can you imagine wrestling if you had a dislocated hip? I mean, that's a pretty painful thing. So as a result, when he says, I won't let you go unless you bless me, it wasn't like he was in control of, of the angel of the Lord and said, okay, I'm in control and you're not going to get out of here until I bless you. No, it was more like a begging. Please bless me before you go. Uh, I, I, don't, I won't let you go because I want this blessing so badly. And so he, he has to submit because he's already in hurt, hurting and pain. He has to submit to the angel of the Lord and the angel of the Lord gives him a new name. And, what, and that name is Israel, which means struggles with God. And so because he struggled with God and he overcame and received that blessing, um, he is the uh, child, that, that's where the, the child of the promise comes from. He, couldn't have, he wouldn't have received any blessings from God if God didn't want to give him any blessings. But it's because he didn't want to, he, he wanted his father's blessing so badly. And then he wanted the blessing from the Lord so badly. He's looking for that relationship with God that Esau didn't want. Is that the Hebrew meaning? Yeah, the uh, Hebrew meaning for um, Israel means struggles with God. That's right. And, and so we become children of God when we struggle with God. We struggle and we wrestle with him, but we have to finally give our sin over to him. And he breaks us and he makes us new again, right? Sometimes, like a wandering sheep, how does a shepherd keep a sheep from wandering? Sometimes the shepherd will break a lamb's foot, a leg. And, you know, like the picture of Jesus carrying the, um, the, the, the sheep on it, the lamb on his neck. That's often because um, the lamb can't walk. And, the, and that's to keep the lamb from wandering so that they won't, they just can't do it anymore. So... It's for their own good that the shepherd does that. And then, of course, the, the leg will heal. They carry the, the lamb until there's some healing, and then they can walk again. But um, that's what happened to Jacob. You know, he was broken. His hip was hurting, and he, you know, and he finally submitted to the Lord. And so that's the way God works with us. You know, you can't claim God's blessing and say, well, I'm... I was born into the Jewish family, so I'm a child of God. We know how Jesus dealt with that, right? Let's look at John's gospel. I, I think this is a, you know, a really um, important connection with what Paul is saying here. Sometimes I wonder if Paul, you know, John's gospel had not yet been written because Paul was executed in 67 AD, so he never would have known this from John's writing, and yet this is certainly something that John... Um, you know, that the disciples would have been talking about and he may have known about it. Okay, so this is John chapter 7, or 8. John chapter 8. Okay, so they're having this discussion. Jesus is having a discussion with the uh, Pharisees. And so they're trying to claim the very thing that Paul is, is condemning here. That you're not a child of, of Abraham simply because you are in the ancestry of Abraham. So John chapter 8, verse 39. Well, the, the verses just before this, he, he tells about... I, don't, I might as well just read the whole thing. Okay. Um, verse 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So, you know, he, he starts this conversation about freedom. And, of course, the Pharisees are going to say, well, you know, oh, we've never been slaves. In verse 33, they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say we, sh we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but... but but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my words. I am telling you what I have seen in the father's presence and you do what you have heard from your father. Okay, so he's saying, my father is God. Your father can't be God because you reject what God has sent, which is, you know, Jesus. And, and so who, who is he insinuating? He didn't say it yet, but who is he insinuating? That's right, the devil. He's saying that yeah, that's who your father is. And they're going to, of course, argue with him. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do the things Abraham did. 
As it is, you were determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing things that your own father does. So again, he's saying, you know, you can't be God's children. You have to be the child, the children of the devil. And then, but they don't get it yet because they say, we are not illegitimate children. They protested. The only father we have is God himself. In verse 42 of John 8, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me for I came from God and now I, and now I'm here. I have not come of my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your, to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. So here they, ha um, Jesus puts them in their place, tells them that you know that the true children of, of God are those who have the faith of Abraham, and so you know that makes us the children of Abraham as we trust in Jesus. So if you go back to Ro Romans chapter nine, we see how. Uh, how, you know, Paul is making this argument. So he was just talking about how he wished all the Jewish people would be saved. But because he's writing this letter to the church in Rome, which, you know, must have had some uh, Gentiles in it as well, you know, he doesn't want them to think, oh, he, he doesn't want them to think, oh, Paul's just concerned about the Jewish people coming to faith in Jesus. What about us? So he, he re lets them know that, Sure, I'm concerned about them, but I'm also, I also want you to know that everybody belongs to the Lord who puts their trust in Jesus. And that's what he was saying. You know, that the true children of God are those who have the faith of Abraham, the children of the promise. And then he gives that expression from verse 9. For, at, for this was how the promise was stated. At that time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Now, why do you think he uses that, that statement as proof that um, that the children of Abraham are those who have the faith of Abraham. Okay, for think of the context. At the time that God said those words to Abraham and Sarah, how old were they? He was a hundred, wasn't he? Yeah, well, he was actually. Wasn't he was, she ninety? Yeah, she was ninety. He was ninety-nine, and then oh, of course, wow. you know, the baby was born a year later when he was a hundred. So, man, <laughs> they're way past having kids. You know, they, have, they had never had any children. They were barren. So when God said, a year from now, you're going to have a child, that means that the only way it's possible for that child to come is that God made a promise to them, and they believed the promise. So the children of Abraham are children of promise, always. They, it can't exist just because he decided, oh, I'm going to have kids. No. His children existed, his first and only child existed because God made the promise. So that's a, a, the absolute same way that anyone else becomes a child of God because God made a promise, I will forgive your sins through my son Jesus Christ. And if you put your trust in that promise, then you are a child of Abraham. See, the promise is free for everyone, but not everybody receives it. Those who have received it are the children of God. So, so the whole point here is, is Abraham and Sarah's child was a miraculous child. And you are a miraculous child of God as well because it's the Bible tells us we were born in sin, right? In uh, Psalm 51, uh, and I was born in sin and in sin my mother conceived me. You know, and it talks about in Romans 3 verse 23, um, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if we've all sinned and we're all spiritually dead, how can we become children of God? Well, because we have to be reborn, and then that means we're a child of the promise because we have been given new life. We've been, life comes out of death. A barren womb bears fruit. We were born spiritually, stillborn, but then we are reborn through the Holy Spirit. So uh, 
it's just as miraculous that any one of us could become a child of God simply by putting our trust in Jesus. That's the miracle, the child of the promise. So he wants to just emphasize that being a child of the promise is all that it takes. There would have been no Isaac if God wouldn't have made the promise. And you wouldn't have been a child of God if God didn't make a promise to you that I forgive your sins through Jesus Christ. Do you trust it? And you trust in the promise. Yes, and then you're a child of God. That's all it takes. It doesn't take anything that you have to do. You don't have to do any special works. You don't have to go dip yourself in the Ganges River. You know, all kinds of these other religions have other things you gotta do. You gotta make a pilgrimage. You gotta do this, you gotta do that. But God says, I sent my son to die for you. I promise that your sins are washed away. Do you believe this? Isn't that what Jesus said to Mary and Martha when their brother died? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet he shall live. Do you believe this? You, if you believe it, you're a child of God. If you don't believe it, then you have just turned your back on the promise and you are not a child of God. So that's the simple truth here. And, uh, and it's helpful for us to look at how the Old Testament patriarchs dealt with this stuff. Because, I mean, they were not any better or worse than us. They were just as sinful. You know, the only thing is that maybe they had some miraculous stuff happening by God coming into their lives. I mean, God hasn't met me on the road and, and invited, I didn't invite him into my tent. Although, Jesus says, whoever gives a glass of cold water to uh, somebody in need is giving it to Jesus. So we probably have met Jesus who just didn't recognize him. Just like the disciples on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection, they were with Jesus and they didn't recognize him. Okay, now he's going to give us some more um, arguments from the patriarchal times in Genesis, in verse 10. Not only that, but Rebekah's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet, before the twins were born, or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. And that's a quote from... Um, from Genesis 25, 23. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And there is a quote, that's from the book of Malachi, chapter one, verse two and three. So if Malachi, in the end of the Old Testament, proclaims this truth that God you know, hated Esau, and again, I, I mentioned this a couple of minutes ago, it's not that God's had a hatred for Esau, but he hated his rejection and his sin. And because he clung to his sin, he was rejected. Uh, you know, God sent G his son Jesus to die for Esau's sins just as he did for Jacob's. But the, it's, a, it's a miracle of predestination that either one of them are part of God's kingdom. You know, we see that Jacob became part of God's kingdom because of his uh, trust in... Um, because of his trust in the Lord... But it was a kind of a process, wasn't it? You know, the very name Jacob means the deceiver or the, the heel grasper. And, you know, he was always trying to do his own thing. And he finally, you know, submitted to God in order to receive all the blessings that God intended for him. But the beginning of this argument in verse 10 was that, you know, he says, not only that, so he says, not only did Abraham have a miraculous child of the promise, Isaac, but he's telling us that Rebekah's children had one and the same father. So... Um, you know, when talking, talking about the twins, Esau and Jacob, they would not have existed if it wasn't for Isaac. And Isaac wouldn't have existed except for God's promise. And then when you see his two children, the older one ended up becoming the one who served the younger one. And that just shows the way that God works, right? God, um, God doesn't do things the way we do things. Humanity says the oldest son inherits, the, especially in the Old Testament time, the oldest son inherits the family blessing and the family you know, inheritance. The younger son you know, normally would have to serve on the farm of the older son because you can't split a, a, a piece of property up into a dozen pieces for all your children. You would, it would, nobody would have anything left after a while. right? So the whole point was that you had the oldest got the inheritance. And that's why a couple of weeks ago when we were reading through um, Romans 7 and 8, we, we talked about why does it say that you are sons of God? Not just because we're, you know, it's not because God has a preference for males, but because the oldest son was the inheritor. So he's actually saying you're an inheritor. So if Esau rejected 
the promise of the Lord, but Jacob received it, then it wasn't because Jacob did anything to, to, to deserve this. In fact, you might even say it was the opposite. He was younger, he was weaker, he didn't have a whole lot of promise. You know, he, you know what, what kinds of things did he do, right? I mean, if he was lost in the woods, he would have probably died. His brother Esau was the hunter. Esau was kind of the, I'm sorry, Jacob was the one who kind of stayed at home, maybe the run to the litter. You know, he, he was weak. But God chooses the weak in order to shame the strong. Right? God doesn't want to um, God doesn't want to uh, do the work of his kingdom through people who would claim the glory, right? You know, someone said, well, you know, oh, I had enough, I had a huge army, so we won this battle, and, and then leave God out of it. You know, what happens to Gideon? When Gideon attacks the Midianites in the book of Judges, how does he win the battle? 300 men. That's right. He had started out with like 30,000, and he sent all of them home, except for 300. And that, that was a miracle. And God said, I want you to win this battle through my strength, not your own. Same thing here. God says, I want to prove that the kingdom, uh, the, the promise to Abraham will be built on a line that will only exist because of faith and not because of strength. So um, Jacob then was strong in faith, but not strong in, you know, in physical traits. And that just uh, gives us uh, a reassurance. Well, and it's not saying that God rejects people who are strong. It just means that it, on our own strength, who, you know, whoever depends on their own strength is, um, is putting their, uh, their hopes in something that will fail them. You know, there's a couple of Proverbs like that. You know, in, in the book of Psalms, you know, do not put your strength, uh, hope in the strength of horses or the strength of kings. But may your strength be in the Lord. Okay, verse uh, 14. Um, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. That's a quote from Exodus thirty-three nineteen. So does God, you know, the, I, I guess in a way you might, that might be the question. God doesn't seem very fair. You know, here he takes the birthright away from Esau. He lifts up people who don't deserve anything. But it's not, be, it, that's, that's actually a false assumption that Esau deserved the birthright or that he deserved to be blessed by God. No, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So it's not because God is unjust. In fact, he is uh, building his kingdom in a way that reveals his true nature. What kind of, what's God's true nature? Mercy. Mercy and love, right? It says at the end of the commandments, for I will show compassion and mercy to a thousand generations of those who love me are called, uh, or who obey my commandments, compared to those who disobey the commandments and then, you know, be cursed to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, says the Lord. So we know that God's true nature is his love and compassion, which is what it says right here in, these, in this quotation here. Uh, so if God is just, you know, he's fair, and he's also merciful, then we see the best of both worlds. God does punish people who are sinners, but he is merciful because he doesn't, uh, he allows the punishment to be placed on his own son. So Jacob trusted in God's promises, and even though he didn't deserve it, his sins are, were, were forgiven because God, um, God did punish Jesus in his place as well as in the place of all of us. Uh, but that quote from, that he mentions here is just kind of like a, a good summary because throughout the Old Testament, there's a lot of passages like this. By God telling Moses that he will show mercy to whom he'll show mercy, uh, doesn't that mean that we shouldn't be jealous when somebody gets something that we don't? Because this reminds me, I mean, that verse right there is kind of like Jesus' parable of the tenant, of the workers in the vineyard, right? I think it's in Luke, where um, it's also in Matthew, where Jesus talks about the, the guys who come to work in the vineyard, the ones who start in the morning, and then they, they're working all day. Then there's, he goes back to the marketplace and then he says, Why aren't you working? Go and work in my vineyard. And at noon, the, some more workers go. 
And then he goes in, uh, back and he sees an hour before sunset, like at five o'clock, he sees some more people and he says, go back and go and work in my vineyard and I'll pay you a day's wages. And he goes and each one of them at the end are coming to get their money and the last ones come first and they've only worked an hour and he gives them a day's wages. And the other people figure, oh man, we're going to get some great money because if, if he gave them like $100 for an hour, man, we're going to get like $300. Or something, you know, they, they just think they expect they deserve more. But when he gives them the same amount, he, they, they're they shocked, you know. And then the, the owner of the vineyard says, are you jealous of my generosity? I gave you what I told you I would give you. And why are you complaining? So to be jealous of somebody else's um, receiving of God's generosity and mercy and love is just a wrong attitude. We're going to get the blessings that God promised us if we put our trust in Jesus. And why should we worry that a person who's on their deathbed gets to go to heaven because they confessed at the last minute? I, we should be thankful because it says in the Bible, the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents than over a hundred uh, you know, believers who haven't done anything wrong, don't need repentance. And that's the most important thing. You know, so I guess... You know, there's a good argument that people might make. If we can like um, live it up and sin all we want before we die, and then to convert at the last minute, wouldn't that be more exciting or better? And you know, well, how would you answer that? Yeah, that'd, that'd be. Well, the reason why it could be uh, tempting is because it sounds maybe there are some things that sound fun, but the problem is that if you're walking down the the path of destruction and death and sin, that path diverges from the path of life. So the further down one path you go, the harder it is to get back to the other. So if you're walking down the path of death, by the time you get to the point where you're on your deathbed, the chances of you saying, I'm sorry for everything I ever did and I want to believe in Jesus so I can go to heaven, your heart will be so calloused and hardened that you'll most likely say, I've lived my life without God. I'm not going to start living... I don't know, I'm not going to start looking to him now. You know, it, your pride is blinding you. So you're actually fooling yourself if you think that you can live a life of sin and, and convert later. Because the chances are like, like Pharaoh. You, I mean, Pharaoh, he, he didn't, at the last minute, didn't he say, okay, Moses, take everybody and go, go off into the desert. But while they were walking out of Egypt, he changed his mind. And that's what would happen. You know, I, a lot of people would say, well, this is ridiculous. Why would I believe in Jesus? Well, he didn't, I, I have no proof that he even existed or, you know. So a person who, who doesn't want to live with Jesus when, in their life, most likely doesn't want to look to Jesus in their death. So uh, that, that's the danger, you know. Uh, there's another passage, in, is, I think it's the book of Acts, where it tells us the day of salvation, I think, actually it's in the book of Hebrews, the day of salvation is today. today. Tomorrow might not come. There may be no tomorrow. So if you hear the gospel, the Holy Spirit is urging you, and this is the day of salvation. Right now, when you hear that gospel, turn from your sin and you will live. Turn to Jesus Christ who's paid for your sins. He loves you and will forgive you all your sins. And all we have to do is accept that gift right here and now in order to receive that, to have that. Now, you know, that's talking about a person who, who, ha who hasn't believed. If, they, if you don't believe and then you come to the, hear the gospel, then don't wait for another chance. Take it now. Um, okay, so in verse 16, it does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Okay, again, there's that whole um, Exodus um, uh, storyline, and he's quoting from Exodus 9, verse 16, where he, God's explanation of the very fact that Pharaoh was kind of a tool. Pharaoh thought he was doing his own thing. I'm not going to let go of the people of Israel because they're my slaves. And God said, nope, I raised you up so that I might display my power in you. Uh, so that the you know the the the, um, the plagues all the, the ten plagues would be able to show that God was more powerful than the gods of the Egyptians, and and it goes on in verse eighteen. Therefore, God has has mercy on whom He wants to have mercy, and He hardens whom He wants to harden. Um, 
it almost seems unfair. Okay, God is arbitrarily choosing some people to, to save and give mercy to and arbitrarily hardening some people's hearts so that they can't get into heaven. So that these are some passages here that you know some groups will use to prove double predestination. And yet, um, just because God might choose to do these things doesn't mean that he didn't know how it was going to turn out in the first place because God doesn't make choices for us. Hardening our hearts is not making us reject him. God does not make anybody reject him. But people who have rejected him, God basically says, okay, have it your way. And if you reject the Lord, the sin against the Holy Spirit, then that, that's where God's mercy and grace are withheld. Jesus said, do not throw your pearl before swine. Why would God say, oh, it's okay, Pharaoh, I know you hate me, and I know that you think that you're God, but I'll let you go to heaven anyways because I want to love you anyways. The gospel message is worthless to people who don't believe in it, and God does not throw a pearl before swine. So by hardening his heart, he was basically saying, the pearls of eternal life are being taken away from you. You don't deserve them, and you'll never see them. And it's only because of the, of the attitude, the attitude of the heart. So God already knew the attitude of Pharaoh's heart, so he hardened his heart. He wasn't making him do something he didn't already do already. It just meant that he was withdrawing those pearls before the swine. And Jesus did the same thing. You know, Did he appear after his resurrection to the Pharisees? No. Why would he do that? They, already, they didn't believe that he was raised from the dead anyways. They would have said, oh, it was a spirit. It was a vision. It was, it was someone put something in our drink and we hallucinated. They would never believe it. No matter how obvious it was, they would find a way to get around the, uh, the truth because they only believe the lie, right? They're the children of the devil, as we heard in John chapter 8. So the same thing is true for, you know, for a person who's saved or not saved. It has nothing to do with, with God you know, um, making us believe in him or, or making us not believe in him. It has to do with the gift. He gives the gift. He's the giver of the gift of faith. And those who receive the gift are saved. Receiving a gift doesn't mean you've earned it. You know, no matter how much you think, oh, I believed and I saved myself. No, it, 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 if, the, if you didn't, if you, just because you stick your hands out doesn't mean that there's a gift coming up, drop them, dropping into your hands. Somebody has to come to you and say, here, I'm going to give you a gift. And if you put your hands out, you can receive that gift. So if it wasn't for God's initiation, I'm choosing you and knowing that we're going to receive that gift, we wouldn't become children of God. But also God, that gift was available to someone like Pharaoh or whoever else who, and because God knows that they're going to reject it, then he withdraws the gift. And he says, no, I'm hardening your heart. And he does that, again, as he says, for his own glory. And, you know, this has to do also with the mysteries of um, God's omniscience. We don't know everything God knows. And so for us to try to say, well, that's not fair of God, is really like saying, well, I know better than God. And, and that's crazy. How could we know better than God? And Paul tries to explain this. Let's, uh, we'll finish off with this last verse here, 19 and through 21. One of you will say to me, then, then why does God still blame us? For, for who resists his will? But who, uh, but who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to, to him who formed it? Why, does, why did you make me like this? And that's a quote from Isaiah 29, verse 16. Um, and he goes on to say in verse 21, Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? So God is uh, doing what he'll do. And certainly it sounds like, you know, God, who can resist God's will? If God chooses that you're going to be condemned, then it makes it sound like, well, they're condemned and it's not our, their fault, you know. But that's... That's not what it's saying. God creates some, uh, some people who will be used for noble purposes and others for common use. But right there, he's actually talking about the use, not the, the salvation. Because Pharaoh was created so that he might be, that God's glory might be revealed in, in Israel and in Egypt. But God didn't make Pharaoh reject him. Uh, so we can't blame God for our um, rejection of God, but we, can, but we certainly can thank God for his gift of eternal life. So, and that's maybe where the difference is. The Bible clearly states that everybody who's saved was saved because God saved them, 
But the Bible also says that those who are condemned is because they rejected God by themselves. God did not condemn them because he just said, well, I just didn't like you. No, condemnation is our fault. Salvation is God's, I don't know if you say it, a fault, right? It's God's um, plan, That's right? Right, so God doesn't promise to send people to hell. He only promises to send people to heaven, and people who go to hell are there because of their rejection. So it's, it's our own fault if, we're, if, we're, um, if we go to hell because of our rejection of God. And uh, you know, he, we have to you know, look at the specific uh, scenario that he's giving to us in this uh, section, talking about, um, about the exodus and stuff like that. Okay, well, by the time he gets to the end of this chapter, he's going to go into a whole bunch of quotations from other prophets. And then there's all, you can see the, um, the quotations in the rest of chapter 9 where he, he quotes from Isaiah and Hosea. And, uh, yeah, mostly Isaiah and Hosea. And, and these are descriptions of talking about, you know, how, how did God's people become his people and how did the, you know, the uh, other nations that have rejected God, how did they get condemned? So... It, he, in a way, he's kind of giving a biblical um, proof texts for the fact that the people of Israel would be saved because of God's power and his mercy, which, as he said earlier, is the only way that anyone's saved. You're a child of Abraham through the promise and your faith in the promise rather than, in, uh, rather than uh, your works or through your ancestry. Okay, well... Next week we'll start um, with uh, verse 22.